My new book, Peace Over Pain, is now available. You can buy it for $20 on Amazon or you can download it for free inside my exclusive Facebook group. Simply go to peaceoverpain.com slash join the group. And between the group and the book, you will learn how to eliminate chronic conditions. Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. Do you wrestle with your ego? Welcome to episode number 163. Today, I'm sitting down with WWE Hall of Famer Rob Van Dam. In this discussion, we dive into the unique business of professional wrestling and how to manage your ego and emotions. We also talk about death, seeking approval, and much, much more. Before we begin, sit down and relax and take in this riveting conversation. Let's begin. Hey, Rob, welcome to the podcast. Absolutely glad to be here, dude. So how do you or did you in your long career maintain inner peace in professional wrestling? I kind of like trip on the word maintain because as you know, it's a growth cycle that like never ends, right? Mm -hmm. So if I just think back a few years, I think about the tools that I lacked and and I think about specific times I lost my cool Mm -hmm. and I'm always ashamed of myself when I do. I don't get mad very often at all. Once in a great while, I'll get overwhelmed, you know, and and that'll, that'll take over that emotion. And then once it does, I can't get back. I don't have a a wide range like most people. Um, Well, one time in WWE, if you're not opposed to a quick little story. uh, So I was wrestling against Chris Jericho and, and the people, the powers to be everybody, they really wanted me to get mad. They wanted Jericho to get under my skin they were convinced that's where the money was, you know? And so it was like, okay, yeah, I got it. I'll be mad. The, they didn't think I could do it. So all day long, everybody, all the agents, and they told other guys to do it too, including Jericho, would come up to me all day. And they said, now remember, just think angry, like replace, like think of something that makes you really mad and get that mental in. I got it. All right, get off me. Eventually, like I was sick of hearing it. Like they got me so, so worked up. Hmm. So worked up. So then uh, right before uh, we went, uh, I went out there, you know, Chris Jericho, he's going out to the ring first and I don't know, he's cutting a promo or something. And then I'm going to run out and, uh, and jump on him. And right before Chris goes out there, when I'm already, you know, like about at my limit, he goes, just get, get really mad. Don't forget, get mad. Like, I'm going to forget. Come on. It's been pounding in my head all day. And he goes, he goes, just like, imagine that I um, hit on your wife. And that was like the, not the right thing to say to me, in my opinion. You know, I was I was offended by that. Like, you mother. So I went out, you know, he's out there talking on the mic. When it was time for me, I went out there. Bam, bam. I punched him in the face. You know, I wasn't holding back. I was bam, bam, punched him down, frog splashed him. They wanted me to cover him and, and one, two, three, and take the belt and me make my own count. I was so uh, pissed. I forgot to even do that. I threw the belt on him. I stormed off. I had to grab my, I couldn't even dress in the dressing room. I had to grab my bags, wow. get out, get in my car, in my wrestling gear and drive off to the uh, hotel. And it took me uh, hours to, to, to cool down because I don't get worked up uh, that, that often. And it's not just maintaining it. It's always learning from the mistakes like that, trying to not let them happen again. And yeah. and really focusing on the things that that are conducive to my Zen as opposed to looking for a contradiction and looking for drama, you know, whatever my list of counterproductive uh things to have on my mind are. What did you learn 
from that experience? Because it sounds kind of dramatic. Well, I mean, I mean, hey, I'm in the entertainment business, you know. I mean, without drama, you got nothing. That's yeah. what it is. That's why. That's why it's kind of you know I act, but I, I'm the most I'm the least dramatic person probably that you'll meet. I. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I always tell people, I think I would think I'm boring if I wasn't me. I don't mm. sing. I don't dance. You know, I observe. Uh, I watch people and I and I try to um, I, I try to rise above always. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm observant yeah. with the social awkwardness of communication and uh, and I have my own values, you know, so I do see when that's you know, someone comes up and they're just bullshitting, then automatically it's like, well, this ain't, this guy's not like me. I happen to have a lot of respect and being genuine and, uh, and being honest. I'm the most honest person that I know. Sometimes that gets me into trouble, but overall I respect it about myself. And that's something that I think if a lot of people had that quality and respected themselves, I think overall they could vibrate at a higher level, a higher mm -hmm. frequency, which makes them a better person. It exudes as you, that that energy out there. People will perceive them in that manner and return it. Um, a lot of people live with guilt. Mm -hmm. And I personally believe a lot of the guilt is unnecessary. Almost all of it is self-invoked. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts, you know, when we're when when we're young and, and in, in Bible school or whatever, and we're told, you know, Jesus gets mad at you if you mm -hmm. use adult language or whatever. And some people never shake that, you know. Um, they or or if you have a, if you have some mother's lay a guilt trip on you, you know, as a yeah, mechanism. There's that. There's that. There's school. You know, um, the, all adults. Oh, yeah, it's it. And, and and then a lot of people have to re or I shouldn't say have to, but. I, I recommend and what I've done, I feel is reprogrammed myself as an adult. Mm. And a lot of people haven't bothered to do that. And mm -hmm. so it's very difficult to try to communicate with people because their mindset sometimes is so far off. I'm glad you just used that term because that's also a term that I use. There's program, you know, we get programmed and then it's on us to deprogram. It, it's very difficult, but the thing that makes it so doable is that common sense pulls you through it. Mm -hmm. As a child, you don't have common sense developed yet. So when you're told, hey, a big fat man is going to park on our roof with reindeer and come down our chimney to give you gifts, you don't have common sense yet. You believe that. You love it. Mm -hmm. And even as adults, people don't want to give that feeling up. No, they don't. But common sense uh, contradicts a lot of what I learned as a kid. I mean, I've relearned actual uh, facts about how the world is run, about society, government, all kinds of things that are not at all like what I was taught. Um, and as you go through life, you have to look at things from a different perspective because you're moving along, looking at it from a different place, a different place in your life. And and so it's something that if you don't bother to do, then then you're just stuck in this limited status quo, um, you know, persona where where the the ability to think is so shallow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we have the ability to deprogram. And I mean, you you nailed it. Most people don't even try. They, you know. They might share some memes on their Instagram or something that are motivational. At least there's that if they do that. Yeah, it's better At than At least nothing. if they're trying to spread positive energy or whatever. But, uh, you know, that whole thing with social media, it's like there's no consequences, right? So people that were brought up with the tech technical age of being able to just think there's no consequence, I'll put this out. And then if I'm completely wrong, oh, well, nobody knows me. You know, that's not the state of mind that uh, that we grew up on. And it's not something that I want to change as an adult. I only want to improve it and get more realization out of out of the truth of that, of consequences. I think one of the biggest programmings that we have as human beings is seeking approval. And yes. it's, it starts with mom and dad, and then it go goes into school getting good grades high school you there's that feeling that maybe you want to be popular or if you're kind of a smart kid you want the good grades whatever it is or your football you want to do really good there's there's that approval absolutely Pro professional wrestling is all about approval your job 
is to quote unquote get over with the fans. Yeah. That's approval. Yeah. E- even if you're a bad guy and they're booing you, that's approval. That's yeah, deep. No- that's deep. <laughs> um there's layers it, it, to that. But it but it but actually, I mean, it's also I think in a lot of ways not different than many other jobs where whatever your job is, you want the powers to be to have the job, the the ability, the position to hire you, to give you a good position, to uh, move you forward in your job, whatever it is that you want. You want to get their approval. You know, in my job, it takes getting the crowd's approval in order to get the higher ups approval. And that may be an extra layer, like you said, but, but really overall in life, I mean, if, if, um, uh, if you and not everybody wants to be the the best at, at what they do, a lot of people are are fine with just coasting by, and that's they're their, content. Yeah, yeah, and, and in a lot of ways, you know, um, if they're content with their job, they may have other priorities that are more important to them, and that's awesome. That's that's completely up to their own, uh, you know, personal situation. But 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 yeah, overall, um, you you gauge how well you're doing um, on the spot. Uh, instant gratification is is in the entertainment business you know um just like if you're whenever you're in front of a crowd whether it's stand-up comedy whatever you know how well you're doing right at that moment so so yeah that's a big part of it and it's yeah. it's, it's weird how how much we crave the approval of everybody you know, mm-hmm. it's it's it, it is something that if if you don't really take the time naturally they always say the older you get the less you care about what everyone else thinks and, and, and that is that is true overall but it doesn't like go away completely or we would all just leave the house with our hair a mess and not care what we look like or whatever if it was yeah. true to that extent but um but but certain certain um times it's a, it's easy to step back from that there's a rumor on social media that I know is completely not true. It makes me laugh. I don't feel the obligation essay to go back and counter it. That's not true because of this or this. Sometimes I just let it ride. And then if it comes up in an interview or something way, way, way later, then I say, yeah, I don't even think I've ever commented on this. I think, you know, for instance, uh, there was something going around that I was like blind in one eye. And um, I thought it was funny, but really a lot of people believe that because they read it on social media. So it has to be true. Mm. Um, but it's, but it, it, there's a lot of strength in, in, in not caring what they think. They think that, so what? But it's in us, you know, like somebody could just say, dude, I'm smarter than you. Dude, I know, no, you're not. We're so defensive. Yeah. Maybe the person is smarter than you. I mean, why are we instinctively would like so against this person thinking that they're smarter than us. It's, it's it's a really weird like thing that's so deep in our psyche that mm-hmm. um, it really takes some um, uh, uh, a lot of growth and uh, and a lot of effort really I think to 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 apply not doing that to your everyday. Yeah. When you got to WWE, did you ever have that feeling of I need to impress Vince McMahon? Was there a pressure Out. there? Always. Absolutely. Yeah. Vince would, on the television shows, we'd have two television shows a week, three when there was a pay-per-view, which was once a month. And then we would have like usually three shows a week that were not televised. So we're on the road nonstop, but the the television shows were a lot more important. um, And Vince McMahon was always at those. And he's one of the first people you pass after you're in the ring, you go up that ramp and you go through what we call gorilla First thing I do is uh, we, we look at Vince uh, and hope to get that approval. Hopefully he's going to stand up, shake my hand and say, outstanding, something like that. You know, like right, if, I, right. if I walk by and he did, and he just like is going to look the other way or something, that's not, not a good feeling at all. Wow. That's yeah. a lot of pressure, actually. And everybody does it. He knows that's his moment to uh to give them the thumbs up or thumbs down yeah he can puppeteer your emotions just from that one walk through the curtain sure wow mostly what i go back to is if you're not disappointing yourself then you win right Mm. especially if you have a good set of qualities a good set of principles um good set of values Really, and then if you're not disappointing yourself, then life is so much better. And I know so many people 
more people than not, way more people than not have some kind of guilt. They do something where they're like, well, I know I shouldn't do this, but, you know, whether it's smoking cigarettes or whether it's drinking or or, or whatever, whether, you know, and I know so many guys that uh, uh, when they're out on the road, they think they're single, getting with, uh, you know, girls and whatever they can. And then they go home and then they're like with the wife and kids and like that. I feel like, man, your family doesn't even really know the real you. Uh, if they don't have any guilt, then they then they I don't know then they almost have to be psychopathic I mean not knowing the situation man you know a lot of them hate their wives feel like they owe them feel like they're getting getting them back whatever like that's everyone's got their own circumstances everything is subjective but overall um that self-imposed guilt by living in a way that you have contradicting values that's that's some way to live and uh and it's not mine right so professional wrestling is, in my view, like the most unique business there is. It, I mean, it is different. There's so many layers to it because there's so much psychology involved. You're seeking the approval of the audience. You're seeking the approval of your big boss who's right there behind the curtain watching you. And then on top of it, you have human beings essentially playing a character, which you guys basically call, or some people call a gimmick, right? Some, some people are playing themselves just turned up a little bit, but you're, you're essentially playing a character and there's these massive, there's a lot of ego that's attached to that. And you get someone and the first person that comes to mind to me is those classic Ric Flair promos, right? When he's just going off the wall. He's talking about his alligator shoes. I mean, he's it's just off the wall. There's no way that you would go to the mall and find someone talking like that, like or just going off like that. It's it's this flamboyance to the 10th level, right? Yeah. How does a pro wrestler not take that home with them? That's almost like, I don't know, being an actor and playing a crazy character on camera or something, but this is different. You know, you do step into it and step out of it much like a actor would a character, but um, you, you not only don't bring that home, you don't bring it back to the dressing room. You got to drop it at the curtain. Right. And some people do have a problem with that. And it's not very popular with the other wrestlers, you know, and that's another one of those levels things that you're talking about, because the people that give the best promos that really have you convinced like this guy really does believe that he's the best. I think he really does believe that. And then, you know, that makes me want to smack him, you know, and, and then uh, when he, and on a lot of the boys, especially old school, now it's different. Everything's different, but old school rules, another level you're trying to impress the guy you're in the ring with especially if you're starting out like if you're uh if you've been wrestling uh less than five years in the business and you're in there with the veteran that's over 10 years there's a good chance that the veteran's going to eat you up especially depending on where you're at you know there's different styles in japan or whatever but certain wrestlers you're going to be tested you know and they're going to see how much you love it how much punishment you're willing to take uh and uh, and also, you know, they're, you're paying your dues, so to speak. That's part of it. So that's a whole nother level. While you're trying to do the right thing, you're also trying not to get uh, injured. You know, you're covering up so you don't get a broken nose or something or to, to limit at least the uh, the amount of um, <clears throat> of what you have to have to take as far as punishment and damage but that, that's a whole other part of it and uh now that it, now it's a lot more corporate um less old school it was like a closed behind the door um kind of society whereas now it's it, it's a lot more open and that's changing it because fans are able to find their way right into becoming a wrestler and they didn't even go up the traditional route. So mm -hmm. as much, as much as they thought it was scripted, guess what? Now it is because they're the ones doing it. And so the whole thing is changing and, and that's causing the actual performers to believe in what they're doing less and less. And it comes out in the product, but the reason that we believed in it so much back then was because, you know, we were beating the crap out of each other. And, uh, and that was part of it. When I got trained by the original Sheik in 89 and 90, 
90. You'd be surprised uh, to learn this maybe, but there was never one time ever where I was taught that uh, this is the way to do a move without hurting somebody or this is the right way to land so that you don't hurt your back. Mm -hmm. None of that. None of, you know, when you grab them in a headlock, don't squeeze them. There was none of that. We all had to, you know, really be, we had to convince the original Sheik, who was our trainer. We, we needed his approval. He's right there watching us. And if we weren't seriously, like, just, you know, really squeezing each other, beating the crap out of each other, and trying to get a pin every time our opponent's shoulders were on the mat. And if we weren't doing that, we did not get his approval. Wow. There, there's approval again. <laughs> yeah. it, it's all relative. All yeah. of it. That's yeah. what makes it true. Yeah. So what happens if a performer gets caught up in their character, can't drop it, comes back through that curtain and, 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 and operates through the locker room uh maybe too boisterous or just caught up will, will they be checked they, they yeah they're they're going to be checked and um a lot of times it's the uh kangaroo court that checks them and by the way uh they're literally is or was a wrestler's court in WWE when somebody got out of hand there was they would be called into a room with a bunch of wrestlers that I never got into any of that stuff. One time I opened the door to see why everyone was in there. When I saw what was going on, I, I rolled my eyes and said, oh, you know, screw <laughs> this. Because I, you know, I, I'm no not part. about that stuff. Yeah, yeah they, they hear the case. They post the punishment. Who was and, the judge? Uh, usually it was Taker. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes Booker T, uh, you know, sometimes you had to work with uh, whoever's there, but um, it was it was uh, someone, you know, in that position that would uh, <laughs> that would preside over the matter. And uh, yeah, lots of times. And otherwise, if it didn't go to court, then then you might. You, you probably want it to go to court over the boys taking care of you in the dressing room. And I don't mm. one in the ring. Yes, definitely in the ring. They, they, they could eat you up, especially someone that really knows, you know, like we got a lot of, a lot of badasses that are collegiate uh, fighters or MMI, MMA uh, competitors, or, you know, there's a lot of guys in the business that don't really know that much about fighting that are just, you know, more into the entertainment part. And, uh, and, and they're not going to fight back because if they do, it'll make it worse when they're getting eaten up. That's, that's part of it. But you've probably also heard of <laughs> One of the ways that I'm not too uh, proud of it being a fact, but some of the guys would find their outfits. Uh, they go to wrestle and they open up their bag and their outfit has been cut up into shreds mm. or worse or worse yet. Somebody is defecated in their bag. Mm. Things like that. Bullying basically. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, usually, or it's usually brought about by somebody that doesn't un understand how the locker room rules work, you know? It's usually somebody that's violated the terms of the boys. It's and, like a, uh, it's like a secret society, man. It's like, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. We had our, we had our own words, our own language, um, and uh, used to be like if anybody came back in the dressing room and didn't belong there, they'd get beat up and thrown out. It was still that way. Like in uh, when I was in ECW, my partner Sabu used to always uh, beat up the the hot dog guy. He would try to cut through the dressing room. And I think it was in Boston. Uh, he would grab him, get out of here, grab him and throw him and throw all his food. And the poor guy, he's just a kid doing his job. Someone probably told him, you know, to go from the kitchen to the counter. You know, it's easier to cut through here. But, but he was brought up old school and he was trying to keep it old school. Now it's crazy. Even they even did a movie. Um, um, it was on Jake the Snake, Beyond the Mat. I don't know if you've heard of this documentary. Yeah. When when that guy was creating that, that was too early. The business wasn't open doors at all yet. And we sabotaged that guy's uh, right. projects. Like there was so many, when, when he would leave, uh, the boys would go through like some of his videotapes and stuff and they'd throw up like in holes in the walls, you know, between the two by fours and stuff. They're probably still there. <laughs> you wow. know, like unseen footage. And uh, he, he'd want to interview us in the dresser. He'd want to record us talking about business, which we were not willing to do, you know? So that thing was ahead of its time. It was about and, 10 years ahead of its time. Yeah. 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 I can see that. Yeah. I remember that documentary very well. It, it was fascinating. Yeah. When I now, saw now it's I was, normal, right? Everyone's doing and, shoot interviews. Yeah. But 
but maybe one could look at it and say maybe that helped bring down some of the walls, which could be said in a defensive way from a, a wrestler. It's wide open to the point to where people imagine that it's something that it's not. And that's like the hidden magic that hasn't left the business yet. Like people think that we get scripts, we all love each other, and that we're almost like playing. They think it looks fun. And that's what's that's what's still cool about it, is that they're all fooled. A lot of us can't stand each other. Yeah. And when you're in the ring, a lot of times you're really competing against each other yeah. to outshine, to outperform, to outlook. Yeah. You know, I said, stay down. I said, stay down. There's a lot of that, you know, and it's yeah. like, uh, so there is, there is still uh, some of what, it's like a new kayfabe, which is what we used to call the behind the doors part yeah. of the business. Yeah. It's like, it's scripted, but it's, it's more the outcome that's scripted. And you guys have to fill in the blanks because you're the artist. I used to wrestle Undertaker um, a lot in WWE and not even see him the day of the show until we get in the ring. I didn't have to know anything. We both knew how what was going to happen in the end, but um, it's it's whatever you want it to be. Like I said, there's probably places now where they get handed like a whole script or something. I've never gotten one except for di suggested dialogue. Like when we do the... Uh, the the backstage um vignettes and they'd have words for us they would give me a script but it was something they didn't mind if i could change it and make it more my own but it was a lot of times i was so offended that they even thought i was close to because it, it made me sound to me anyway like i was so dumb you know i'd be like some of the words were like oh yeah no uh i'd read it like that and i'd say you really think i'm gonna say that when i'm talking to somebody but <laughs> um, but besides that, no, I don't, I've never had like a, a script handed to me that tells me like the moves and whatever, but anyway, th there's always, I think there's black and white and all kinds of gray in between. There's still a lot of different styles. There's different, uh, levels of, uh, shoot or, or work style and uh rough style. And, you know, they have these death matches, which if that fits into, uh, anywhere, you know, in the, in the spectrum then we got a wide spectrum. You mentioned The Undertaker. Did you need his approval? Um, well, yeah. I mean, if I would have been like uh, the complete, you know, um, drizzle and shits <laughs> um, during the match, then um, probably I wouldn't have wrestled him again. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, definitely. I mean, that could go really bad for you if you, if you had a total disapproval from The Undertaker. You're probably not even going to stick around yeah he's 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 like the top top guy uh as far as the uh the office stepping into the dressing room yeah there's so many stories about the undertaker floating around he's like yeah. the cat captain or yeah but he was but he seemed cool he seemed cool but he was very influential on what was going on no doubt about that so you would want his uh triple h when he was in the dressing room everyone would kind of like stiffen up you know and be a little more on their best behavior because um his position you know and then uh and then sometimes like when we would be at the non-televised shows sometimes there wouldn't be some of these guys around and it was a completely different atmosphere kind of like you have a substitute teacher when you're in high school or something your character was unique because again in wrestling they're typically very boisterous very outgoing and you're you're calm cool confident your cockiness would just come from pointing <laughs> you know pointing while you're saying your name was that really rob van dam the real person absolutely um turned up a little bit you know but now it's it's more of a change from being in the ring than being here on the couch because i realize that uh really i'm probably an introvert you know i hardly ever leave the home when i do i'm not the one that is seeking the center of attention you know um I I like to drive a very normal looking car that doesn't stand out. Same with my dress and everything. I get enough attention um, and I get recognized everywhere. And I feel like on my time off, I don't, uh, I don't crave that. I don't, um, I also to balance out, take a break from it. You know, it's, it's weird sometimes when you think, you're on your time off just being yourself and you're driving on the highway and then you turn and you see everyone's freaking out in the car next to you and they have a video camera on you and that's happened several times and it's it's like um it's cool that i 
stand for something in their life that's so ex excitable, you know, at the same time, um, I'm very grateful, but not as excited on my time off. Um, you know, I'm not uh, the, the the cockiness, the, the boister ego of the character that, that I have to put out there. Um, I did used to feel that more when I was in ECW. It was easy to really feel like I was the best wrestler in the dressing room. And, you know, and maybe I would get voted at that time that I was the best they had. I've certainly heard it a lot, but now I, I now I accept real truths more such as, uh, everything is subjective. So if, if someone else said Lumini was the best wrestler, then guess what? They're right. <laughs> you know, so, but at the time being so competitive, um, I did have to be that, that wrapped into it um, with my own real feelings to even be able to project that. So even on my time off, I wasn't uh, this, the same balanced person that I am now, if that makes sense. Well, it's pretty cool that you made it to the top you made it into the hall of fame without having to scream and yell i resisted that my whole career they always wanted me to yell scream yeah. wanted me to yank my ponytail uh, out and shake my hair they thought right. that that was going to be yeah i so many things were suggested yeah it and, was and, and i was like hey don't you got enough of those dudes you know <laughs> well i think now we're seeing it with roman reigns I thought you were going to say Matt Riddle because he's he basically does everything that they suggested for me and right. stuff that me and that I came up with as well. You know? Right. He yep, yeah, that is true. But Roman's new character is very reserved and very relaxed, and that's it's rare. It stands out. He does have a chill vibe too. Whenever I've been around Roman, you know, he seems very calm and relaxed and um yeah that's that's cool that they can let him uh be himself more and um you know if if, if i was in control which we can never control what people think about us but if i had something to say about what kids would take from watching me i'd much rather have them pick up on that kind of stuff on you know accepting things and 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 you know being more stoic instead of mm -hmm. you know getting angry flying off the handle <laughs> that leads to trouble and a dramatic life very not zenful mm. what types of methods do you do or have you studied in order to keep mindfulness i mean one um i mean cannabis helps helps me and it's very conducive you know so i gotta say that as i'm standing here uh smoking yeah. the joint but um i when i was in martial arts i had a couple of different instructors that really opened up my mind to my first awareness mm. uh and, and, and perspective uh one of the ways that, that, that one of the guys taught me you know we were meditating we all had our eyes closed for a while and stuff and then he started having us visualize and we were visualizing an overhead view of ourselves and then we just kept panning out like look at yourself with this class of 20 people you know take it all in and then you go up and then you're looking at yourself with the whole block that you're around and you go up now look at you you know with the whole with the whole city look at what a speck of water you are and you keep going up eventually mm -hmm. you're gonna feel like all your problems that seem like they're going to end the world they're not really that significant to the overall picture you know That's there's right. always a bigger picture too so never really think that you that you have everything you you know it's always a bigger picture so there was that that guy was really helpful and there was another guy that taught me uh a different way uh, uh of meditating to to reach a point of like 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 almost like like floatingness of the brain where you're actually you disconnected everything that you've already thought about everything from the taking in my left pinky to feeling the wind blow on behind my right ear. you've gone through everything so many times over and over internal external internal external to where you eventually end up in a in a spot of, of of inner peace where you're actually not thinking of anything you've already gone over that song that kept popping in your head you've already gone past it but you can't put a time on that you never know how long it's going to take and that's why as an adult it's a lot harder than as a kid as a kid i you know i could just get there every time and now sometimes you know you might go for it and not even get all the way there but even if you get a lot of the way there you're gonna feel like your brain is so much more refreshed and um so that that started my uh my perspective on the whole thing always been a fan of martial arts 
and uh, and their beliefs and just overall what I what I knew about Eastern philosophies and stuff. And I've read some good books and I've studied, you know, um, several arts along the way, which also are consistent, you know, with uh, with Zen, with the yin and yang. Um, I have read a few books that I'll throw out there um, that really helped me. Uh, and, and a lot of people that read this book as well, so the Celestine Prophecy, say the oh, same yeah. thing. Oh, yeah, I right? got it right there. I got it up right there. Yeah, yeah a lot of people like, uh, and I get goosebumps just, just mentioning it. And yeah. they talk about that in the book, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Explain that in there. And it's real. I got goosebumps. Why don't yeah. I, you know? But anyway, that one, yeah. as is with most people, that completely changed my life into seeing everything as energy. And then everything just made so much more sense. I liked the the secret um yeah um the four agreements you know that yeah. oh i love that one i've had don miguel on this on this podcast before. yeah um but i also have always worked on growing my connection with the with the bigger it whatever it is you know what i mean like i <laughs> I can't tell you, oh, I know for sure that Jesus Christ is with me and he walked on water. I mean, those are stories. But what I what I know as true is that I feel like there is a greater power, greater plan, uh, whether it's we're one and the same or whatever. There's an external energy that that's not as describable by science but that runs everything it's like a network of energy that we all feel that causes synchronicities to happen the other sides of the world at the same time and you know once i started documenting all that stuff i you know really got excited about growing my relationship with this power which i call the universe the more i grew my relationship with the universe uh, the just the better I felt like it's just pulling me in the right direction. Oh, I wanted to say this. That's why I brought that up. Um, the one time when my relationship hit a whole new level, this was so long ago, I might have been like 26. I had my own apartment and I was so stressed out, girl problems, job problems, all kinds of stuff. And and I was trying to meditate to um get get rid of the stress. And I was looking at a yin yang poster on the wall. And uh as I as I got deep, I guess I must have opened up my eyes after I've been sitting there a while. But the poster explained the yin and yang to me. And and that was like so enlightening. Uh, I saw it as as two counterparts, each trying to overcome each other at the exact same time with the exact amount of force in this. And th this would create a perfect current uh like like a stream of water in a brook but it's not perfect because there's all kinds of obstacles in it that interfere with the the pathology so every problem that i had was just a rock and i could i could i could think about what's bothering me all mm -hmm. right i put it in there what's or i see it see it see it and instead of feeling overwhelmed by all these things i saw like four or five rocks of different size that were blocking and as i just drew attention to them just being aware i was able to pull the pull it out and then mm -hmm. cause the stream of energy to then you know flow effortlessly through and so that became uh the my my lifelong goal is to try to get as close to that perfect stream as possible knowing nobody's perfect but knowing the closer to it that i am the better me i am enlightenment yeah, I, I totally like after it did, they was spinning on my wall in front of me. I saw it moving and I saw the the flows like having to evade, not stop, but they had to go around the obstructions. And it was so obvious what needed to be done. And after that, you know, I, I just realized like uh, more than ever that uh, my relationship uh, with the universe is, is always, always, always with me through good and bad. And mm -hmm. I imagine it always will be when I get disconnected. I know. I know it's very obvious in the Zen tradition. That's typically called a Satori. Sweet. And, and it, it takes a few Satori's for us, or even sometimes just one for us to really have that understanding. And that's what it sounds like you had. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. And that was so long ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just uh, recently, like I've always considered myself stoic and heard that term many times, but I didn't until recently, I didn't really know that there was such a thing as stoicism as a philosophy yeah. that people yeah. 
I didn't know. I just thought it meant, yeah, I don't show much emotion or, or I'm not, no. not very expressive. Because I looked into it, like I, I'm almost like a perfect match for it. And I feel like like yeah. I just agree with like everything they're telling me and it makes sense. I call it European Buddhism <laughs> because it's the same <laughs> thing as Buddhism. Yeah. It's really the same thing. It's all the same thing. And, and I think that's yeah. one of the one of the great advances of modern times is mindfulness which is the new hot term and it takes it takes the spiritual edge off of it so that a, a, a heavy christian or a heavy jewish or a heavy a heavy muslim person can do mindfulness without feeling like they're disobeying okay yeah that guilt yeah, yeah that guilt there you go back to the guilt yeah, guilt, approval, man, we got to address all this, right? It's all the same. Yeah, just like you said, you nailed it when you said it's all the same. It's all just our own subjective perspective. I think at the end of the day, we have this computer, right? Yeah. And there's just, just data playing and it's all coming from programming, man. What triggers you these days? Or are you feeling completely equanimous? No, you know, I've had a few mistakes. <laughs> a few flaws you, you smirked my... when i said that <laughs> yeah because uh, yeah <laughs> but i'm not you know i mess up and i'm not proud of it when i you know but it's like i i uh like i said it takes a lot to overwhelm me normally or somebody has to really go out of their way to prove to me that they're trying to offend me you know what i mean <laughs> That, that happens, but I had a, a rough day traveling recently where a, a flight from London to Las Vegas, I, I didn't sleep one wink on it. Everybody was partying on it, you know, and I kept, I kept almost saying something to them, but I already like that earlier that day, I had a couple of things where I said something. I'm usually the most passive. So if I say something to somebody, you know, like the girl at the, uh, uh, trying to get into the, um, the lounge. Right. And she's like, uh, what flight are you on? And I'm like, well, I'm on, such and such, you know, but I have, I have um, status on such and such. She'd be like, and you want what? And I said, to get in there. And she's like, and you remember this? I said, I told you I have this. And then she's like, and you're flying today? And I was just like, I didn't get mad, but I was just like, why do you keep asking me the same questions? Do you think that I'm lying to you? For me, that's almost a blow up, you know what I mean? But I'm not ashamed of myself. I'm proud of myself at that point. I'm like, you know what? That was fine. You know, you didn't. But after that trip, um, man, this is a pet peeve of mine when you when you get because I fly all the time. When you get off the airplane, the front row gets off first, right? Then the second row gets off, right? The third row that gets off. And you watch this, everybody has to do it. Um, I'm like four or five rows from the back of this plane. And then when it's finally my turn and I go to get up, this dude from two rows behind, he'd like run up. And he's standing in my way, so I can't get out. That's a pet peeve of mine. It's like one of the rudest things I think that people do to me on the regular. You know, I mean, somebody will get mad when a car speeds by you. You go, oh, what's your big hurry, buddy? But you have no idea what that guy's going through his mind. You have no idea what he's doing. But also, that dude is taking the risk of getting a ticket. He decided to take a risk that you're not this guy. He, even though everyone else off the airplane waited until the row. So anyway, as you can see, and, and yeah, I blew up on him. I blew up on him a, a little bit more. You know, I was just like, how the fuck am I supposed to get up when you're standing in my way? You got a special ticket or something that you don't, you don't have to wait, even though everybody else did, you know? And anyway, he was like, oh, I'll take that. I, can say, I said, yeah, whatever. Hope you make your fucking flight or whatever you're running to, you fucking <laughs> asshole. <laughs> and then when we get off the plane, he's like two people ahead of me as we're walking off and he's like miss this gentleman in the glasses right there he he uh, swore at me oh that set me off because that's one of my things too people that think adult language is illegal they're right. among the most shallow thinkers you know so i then i had to really go off on i said yeah it's called adult language fuck you if you can't handle adult fucking language what's she gonna do with my <laughs> motherfucker so then i gotta walk behind him like for for like the next five minutes and i'm just motherfucking him the whole way you fucking asshole fucking dumb it you know and then later on i was not really proud of myself i was like you know you can't do that de-escalate bro de-escalate so like you said earlier when you go there you stay there for a little bit right you yeah. stay angry. Yeah. What? Didn't, didn't recover from it. Oh, That's it. You all got to recover and be, be at your best again. Otherwise, you got all that toxic energy that's just building up. But when you do that, there's something in you 
that's ready to fight. Because that person could have just turned around and punched you in the face. <laughs> so there's something in you that's saying, I'm ready to fight, if need be. We I agree. It's a very primal thing to to feel and it's you know it's almost embarrassing it's like i feel like a caveman at that point because you're right and i don't know i i i, I it's not just people like me but people like me that are physical obviously like that's in the back of our mind like hey eventually this could lead to a fight so I, i'm all right with that but there's also what about people that would never fight that have no problem yelling at people getting in their face and never think there's going to be consequences of it you know Right. What about those people like Karen's? They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And if they get slapped, they'd be like, oh, oh my God. Like, they never ever expected that. Call the how police. Do they, <laughs> how, do, how do they get, how do they do it if they don't have that feeling in the back that, that I do or people like me? Or how about that kid on the plane that was poking Mike Tyson? What was that yeah. like three, four months ago? Yeah. And yeah. Mike just turned around and started wailing on him because yeah. he just well, kept taking it too far, right? Yeah. And it's Mike Tyson, like 50 year old Tyson or not. That's Mike Tyson. <laughs> Fuck yeah. He, know, yeah. he knows how to throw punches. Uh, yeah. I've had worse than that that I can't really talk about right now. Okay. The bottom line is I, you're, uh, you're okay with real physicality, right? If I wasn't, I could never step in the ring, bro. I had to believe that I could take care of myself um, just to be in the ring with somebody. I can't imagine feeling like vulnerable that this person across the ring 110 percent would just completely destroy you and you'd have nothing to, to say about it. i can't imagine being in that feeling that's that that's part of my probably competitive mindset that hasn't left you know before wrestling i kickbox i was always showing off and challenging myself i don't think everybody has that drive um for sure that's in there you know, like I said, nobody's nobody's perfect. And uh, that's something that I, I find myself distancing from more and more, the more energy I put into uh, my spirit. So those kicks that you would throw in wrestling, which are impressive that you're not literally knocking their head off. Uh, you could throw one of those. You could throw one of those for real. Yeah, I did not learn. I did not learn those kicks from imitating pro wrestlers throwing fake karate kicks. I learned those in the dojos and in uh, in kickboxing matches and sparring and uh, and by some uh, some really good trainers. And so that's always been part of me, and it always is. I mean, if somebody if somebody's doing doing me wrong, it, it's weird. But yeah, like when I think in defense, um, then the big guy does come out in my brain. I mean, I can feel it. It's, you know, it's not the same as like my dad, my dad, but somebody would like pass him in the, on the wrong lane or someone's in the left lane too long, you know, and then they're going slow in the left lane. So you can't, cause they don't know that's for passing, whatever he'd pass him. My dad would feel um, entitled to give them dirty looks, but what the, what the, he would feel entitled to do all that, but I'm sure I'm sure in his mind, he never, ever been considered that it could come to physicality in my mind. Of course. I mean, how many times have I had somebody tell me to pull over and had to fight <laughs> mm. three or four, but, um, but then a lot of times that I didn't pull over, but, but that's, that is something that, you know, is, is different. I think in our psyche, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But not everyone, can, not everyone can throw hands. Not everyone can fight. But would you react if you were, if you went off the handle and lot and, and your pet peeve and you exploded on somebody, could you react in a way where you would not, you would need that have that foundation behind it of okay, this guy might respond in a physical way. You need that in order to confront somebody. Mm. Well, I would take it as an opportunity to use mindfulness to try to rise above it. Well, hopefully, I will in the future. It's but it's like I said at the beginning. It's probably the hardest thing, yeah, in this existence, is to buck your emotions essentially and you have to be careful not to repress them yeah because if you repress them now you're holding something and eventually something cathartic is going to come out at some point yeah yep for sure and Learn that's that. what that, that's what happened to me i went through an event called dark night of the soul and okay. it lasted seven months it was insane like wow. yeah but i came out of it completely different in a good way yeah, I'm not scared to die. 
Okay. <laughs> because in Dark Knight, you basically feel like you're going to die the whole time. <laughs> okay. Interesting. It, it's probably worth noting um, at one point, and this is long, it's just, I, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, I was doing an interview and somebody asked me, isn't, isn't there like a conflict of interest with trying to be so um, Zen passive and, you know, um, trying to acquire all these uh, laid back uh, qualities while at the same time you're a pro wrestler and they're fighting any any kind of for and, and and they really got through to me and I realized that that really was um, a bit of a struggle that I didn't even realize that I had and, and it was and I could see where it was apparent with things that that were suggested to me that I didn't want to do but then once I really realized it I'm thinking like man I wonder how many kids are watching me uh, that that think the right thing to do if somebody you know makes fun of you is to you know go crack them in the head with a chair if they're talking about you or something you know and it, yeah. I'm like I don't have enough control to change everything and you know I said I was able to separate it to be able to do my job um, but obviously it was it was still uh, a reflection of uh, a different wrestler than than everybody else because of the the comp the the compromise that I made in my mind and everything but. But really, I mean, like, um, I think the people that grow up on wrestling or, or your kids, they, they do think that, you know, they think, uh, well, there's a challenge. You should accept it. And in real life, like, uh, that's that, that's rarely something that I'm going to do. If there's a challenge, you know, like, hmm. unless it's, I can't imagine, you know, everything, there's always exceptions. But, yeah. Yeah. but if you catch me, yeah. But that used to be me. So, Rob, are you ready to die? Um, I, I'm as ready. I think I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't scare me. Um, a lot of my peers, um, come across maybe cold hearted, but I understand when they say like, we almost have gotten numb to watching each other die. Yeah. Like my friends have been dying since 2001, no 97, I guess was the first time that I had like a really close, close friend of mine that I hung out with die. I honestly didn't know it was possible before that. I hadn't made that connection, especially off the lifestyle we were doing. And then like so many wrestlers left and right, boom, boom, boom. And then, you know, a lot of people are shocked. Oh my God, can you believe, I can't believe so-and-so is gone. And, and honestly, it's for me, a lot of times it's like, yeah, I'm, I can believe it. It sucks. It sucks. I don't like it, you know? And, uh, and the bad uh, vibes go on to the loved ones, you know, like, Shit, if I if I die, uh, you know, uh, tonight, I'm probably not going to resent the stuff I didn't get done because I won't know. Um, but for sure, my wife and uh, uh, people that love me and stuff would for sure have to go through a lot of grief and pain. And so that's why I don't see how people can be so empathetic to be like murdering people for, you know, for a ham sandwich like they do. Yeah. Yeah, death is a big topic on this podcast. I'm sure I never thought I would live this long when I was uh, in my teen years anyway, probably, you know. Are your yeah. parents still around? Because you're around my 50, mom right? Is, mom is, uh, dad, dad is gone. How did you handle that? Um, It was a really hard, hard uh, time for me. I actually uh, have talked a little bit about it on my documentary, Headstrong, which is on Amazon. Uh, because uh, I'm filming, I was actually filming a stand-up uh, comedy tour to make a little doc out of it. Mm -hmm. And I happened to get a concussion like a couple of days before the match or the, the the tour. So the whole time I have this concussion, it doesn't go away. It's the only one I've ever had that just didn't shake off, you know, and, and this one uh, stayed with me for like a uh, uh, at least like a year and a half, I was going to uh, vision therapy, all this, but I made a movie out of it, Headstrong. But um, what happened was I got hit with a trifecta. Uh, I was at the lowest, lowest low that I've had to go through. My marriage was, was it, it had been canceled, you know, it was gone, but the, the wife had just, just left. Uh, she just left to, uh, so now I'm in this big, cold, empty house and then uh and all I had was a little dog and then the dog died like three days later uh. boom unexpectedly from uh 
So I have to get her teeth clean and anesthesia that they put in, just boom, drop to the four year old. So at this point, like I had very little left in me, you know, I was like really like just in a really bad, bad, bad spot where Darkness. the next. The narration I was telling myself too was like, dude, you are fucked. Like, dude, what what if your dad dies now? Because he was sick. Like, you gotta get up, put your hands up, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you're not gonna be able to take this. This might, this might fucking do you in. And I told myself, told myself that. And then of course my dad died, and I just kind of drank myself, uh, <laughs> drank myself like throughout like most of 2016. Wow. Yeah. What made you go to the alcohol? um i think you're, it was you're a smoker you're a smoker yeah yeah you know i kind of felt entitled and mm -hmm. i felt like i deserve to uh you know to live this this time where it's really weird because like when i smoke i'm a functional smoker i smoke and do everything you know all day it's uh it's me feeling like i'm at my best uh but uh with with drinking you know it's uh it's it's it was like the weirdest feeling where the first time in like over 20 years, it didn't matter where I was, what time it was, where I'm going tonight. If I was in between bookings, it was like nobody was looking for me anywhere. It was just the weirdest feeling of nothing mattering hmm. to me. And, uh, and so what I did a lot of times, I would take a booking and then I would stay like an extra week just for the hell of it did that in chicago and in florida and some different places and i would just i go out and drink and be an idiot mm, you were already I, mean, there. I knew that i wasn't i knew that i wasn't being productive at that time but i felt entitled to it and i and i know a lot of people know what that's like where they're like you know what i deserve this misery back off and of course grief takes some time everything takes time but you have to want to change you have to uh be able it's your self-narrative that's not it, your self-narrative is totally directed by what you want so if you want to feel sorry for yourself and be miserable then uh that's what you're going to tell yourself to do you know and if you really are ready for the change you're ready to for the pick me up or whatever then uh um you know then then and a lot of times still people need help i actually needed medication i couldn't get up without it couldn't mm. get up it was yeah. like a, a depression. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. So what do you, if someone, if uh, some 20 year old kid comes to you and says, I'm depressed, I'm in the bottle. What do I do? What would you say? Well, one thing that when I think about other people, I've never been, I've never had addiction issues. You know, I've always been able to just not do something and then just not do it, you know, for days at a time or however long I want to at a time. So like even during that, you know, sometimes, but um, well, yeah, you know, I would want to get them off that path and, and I would, uh, I would tell them they have to change their mindset. And when it comes to depression, you know, if you can't, kick out by the three count sometimes you need a little help sometimes you need a partner to give you a hand you know and and pull you out and that could be a doctor and so many people are afraid or embarrassed or just against talking to a doctor um i was i didn't want to admit that i was that low making that call was so hard to do but i got my own cbd line rvd cbd it's it's helping so many people with like anxieties um, you know, uh, sleep disorders and uh, um, all, all kind of amazing things. Even like girls tell me it helps them with their menstruating cycle. I mean, the CBD helps your bone density. There's so many because it goes through your whole system like a diagnostic check and looks for things that you need fixed. You know, um, but it's it, it's you know it's all about our brain and and the dope the um, the mighty the mighty morphins that uh, that the brain releases uh, into your body and, and some of us aren't at the right levels and that's going to cause all kinds of problems and then what go see a doctor talk to somebody if you have a great counselor sometimes they can explain to you why you feel the way you do before i get to my last question where can people come find you and in your cbd line yeah so that one's real easy rvdcbd.com um same on instagram uh and uh keep up with me on, on my youtube page and it's uh the real RVD, just like all my social media. So 
my last question is I think unique because wrestling is unique in the fact that not only does it have layers in the performance and business side, but now there's a new business side where people go and talk crap about each other and they're called shoot interviews (laughs) and they're very popular. It's actually a little negative in a way, Um, but it's a huge business. My question is what three pro wrestlers do you feel need more inner peace? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) That's a thought question. (laughs) I can't even uh, name three wrestlers. Um, I think everybody could use more inner peace. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna use that perspective so that I don't feel like I'm slamming <laughs> anybody. Um, it's different than uh, who's the greatest five of all time and who's the. Yeah, I hate it when somebody tries to ask, get me to bury somebody too. Like, who do you hate the most? <laughs> and like, you know. Um, so let's see who's having some issues right now. Um. Or just anyone you've ever about, worked with who's um, wound up too tight. Bob Holly was wound up tight, so we'll throw him on there. <laughs> um, Billy Gunn is wound up uh, pretty tight. <laughs> we'll throw him in there. And um, let's throw Jeff Hardy some inner peace because he's struggling through some rough times. And uh, right. some peace could uh, definitely definitely help him, help his spirit out for sure. Right. Yeah, we all could use a little more, right? Yes, sir. That to me is the ultimate goal is to be untriggerable. Yeah, right. It's uh, I, I I recently uh, changed like one of my triggers, you know, because I realized that's if you have a pet peeve, you're you're looking to get angry, you know. And I and I I had to real I had to tell myself that, but what it used to be was like when I'm at an intersection, waiting to turn left. And there's a car ahead of me. Uh, when they won't pull out into the intersection when it's green, that would drive me nuts because the light would go uh, from green to yellow, and they're still back behind the white line to red, and then nobody's gone. You know, you're supposed to pull out into the middle of the intersection and then turn left when it's clear. And I used to go around them sometimes, or I'd lay on the horn. And then, yeah, recently I decided, you know what? When I uh, see that from now on, I'm just going to think, well, that person doesn't know they have the right to go out to the inter- middle of the intersection. <laughs> you know, they change it like that. Instead of getting mad, I just chose to react differently. This person doesn't know. Perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. We're all in our little own little dream world, you know? Yep. So e- yeah. Even even going back to approval, if if you're seeking approval from, let's just say Vince McMahon, his approval is a dream too. So it's one dream to the other dream. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just opinions, Absolutely. which aren't real. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. I think that I know the answer to this. I want to see if you think uh, the same thing that I do. What would, you know, knowing that we all have a basic uh, concept of what's right and wrong and having that in mind, what is it uh, about doing the right thing that would make, um, many people stop at a four-way stop sign with no other cars around out in the middle of the desert. Don't say their brakes. I think that a lot of people, my wife included, I think that she would make a complete stop at a four-way stop sign with no other cars around in the middle of a desert because she has that in her mind. This is what you're supposed to do. And that's right. what I wanted. That's what I wanted to get at. Like, what is it about people if it's not, the, the big guy upstairs or the universe. Um, cause, cause, cause common sense and logic tells me I can roll through that and I'll save so much energy. I save energy on the brakes on the, you know, reaccelerating after slowing down. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I, but, I was, but, but is it right or wrong or is it programming? Exactly. That, like, that we're, we're just programmed to stop because we've been doing it so many times. I don't know. Right or wrong is, interesting it's like if there's a spider on your wall is it wrong to kill it no. I, I don't know who's to say um if it's in my house yes yeah. spiders uh, <laughs> they are not allowed to be in my house punishment by death I, I tell them all that before i kill them right or wrong i've seen on your on your um 
Instagram or even in your TNA days, you would be in a hot tub with two or three women. Is that wrong? Some people would consider that wrong. That's true. Now, here's the thing about that. I think that the majority of the people that would shame me probably lie mm. to me. To me, that's a, a really high respected value that I have is I love that I'm honest and that I don't lie. And so I think a lot of people that shame me, if they're lying to their wives, whether they're banging someone else or even flirting a little with, you know, the delivery girl, whatever it is, most people have to put up that wall of protection in order to live in their bubble, to make the most out of their life with what they have. For me, um, I, I shame them and, and I think that they live uh, a complete lesser life just by just by lying. I mean, I, lying changes history. It, you know, it, it's like um, I want speaking again, again of death, you know, so many of my friends uh, have overdosed from prescription drugs and so many have committed suicide. Both have been attributed to long-term concussion damage. This is why I started RVD CBD. So I could get in on uh, chasing with that. But um, when, when somebody dies too often, they don't, they don't report the cause of death when it's suicide and it's out of respect for their family. But that, um disappoints me every time because i want to know like you know wrestlers die almost every week still and it's like how'd so-and-so die and i look and i go to look and it doesn't tell me and it's like for sure if anybody wanted the purpose to be known it's the person that killed themselves right mm -hmm. i mean if you're going to take your own life you're probably going to want people to know that you did that mm -hmm. yeah. most likely but and so anyway, I've always said, no matter how I die, I hope everyone, you know, even if it makes me look like an idiot, like if I die, if I'm the first person to ever overdose on marijuana and die from marijuana toxicity, of course, I would want everyone to know like, oh, I was, I was wrong. Don't do it. I wouldn't want it hidden. You know what I mean? So um, I, like I said before, genuine means a lot more to me than it does to a lot of other people. Authenticity. But, yeah. Anyway. Lying is. Yeah, you can make a case that that's on One the way. side of wrong. For sure, it changes history. Yeah, I mean, I I date I date multiple women, and if they ask, I tell them if they want to leave, they can leave. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> that's perfect. That's being up front. There's nothing. In, that's the great thing about um, about Katie is like she's always known that I'm just always going to be honest and open and want her to know the truth about me so she can judge me by that. You know, when you find somebody that knows all about you, everything and, and your flaws and everything, and then still really thinks that, you know, you're their favorite person, then that's an awesome match. I know I never had it before. And, um, you know, that's, we're so happy. And everyone always tells me, it's so good to see how happy Katie makes you, you know, and I love that. It makes me happy to hear that. So, but um, especially, especially if we have another girl in the hot tub with us, like Jennifer. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. Although some people will say there is, but that's okay because that you don't need their approval. No, I got my approval back to that. And I'm everything that I wanted to be when I was a kid. Right on. Absolutely. All right, Rob, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time. May peace be with you.